All right, so this is the title of our message today. The Resurrection, Our Victory Over Sin and Spiritual Death. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you are victorious over sin? All right, so think about the last few times you messed up. Do you think you're still victorious over sin? Wow, okay, that takes some faith to believe that. All right, and then you believe you have victory over spiritual death. Do you believe that you can still go to hell as a believer? And you know, some people do, some people, and I used to, I used to believe that, I was taught that, and I used to believe that. I used to believe that no matter how good I can be, if I just mess up and I happen to die during that mess up, that I would go to hell, and believers could go to hell. And then on top of it, I was shown this video of this pastor in Africa somewhere who uh, was doing the work of God. Everyone knew him as a righteous man, but behind closed doors, he would mistreat his wife. How many of you are familiar with that story? And so one day he's driving after having mistreating his wife real bad, and I'm not saying that that's a good thing to mistreat anyone, but he was driving and he had an accident, I think, and he died. And he actually came back to life days later at a Rhino Bonke crusade. And um, he shared his story, how he, as a pastor, as a believer, as a man of God, because of the way he treated his wife, he went to hell. And I don't remember all the details, but it, I mean, when I saw that, I actually watched the video. And then I saw Rana Bonke afterwards, you know how passionate he could get. And uh, he would get real passionate and just share his heart. And I know he meant well. But basically, when I was done watching, I thought, I'm probably going to go to hell. And I was in ministry, I was a pastor, because who measures up? Who really, truly can be that good? You have to be perfect. And so, exactly, no one. And so, yeah, after that, I went through a season of doubt. I doubted everything. And um, anyway, long story short... Not so long ago, about two years ago, I found out that that pastor had actually got caught up in something else, and he had done something similar to his wife, and uh, he then supposedly privately revealed that he had made up the whole thing, and it wasn't all true, and uh, anyway, it's, you know, at the end of the day, we have to believe the Word of God. We have to believe God. Not, testimonies are great, stories are great, movies are great. It's great to hear all of that, but at the end of the day, our faith has to be established on God and His Word and what He says. Otherwise, we could be sent down a path of destruction. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, am I the only one that has ever felt, you know, after being a Christian for 10, 20 years, and I look back and I hear all this legalistic teaching, how I'm going to go to hell if I don't do this, and this is going to happen to me if I do that, and if I don't do this, and this is going to happen to me. How often have I thought, you know, I just wish I never knew about Christianity. (laughs) Now, some of you will probably not want to agree with me, but I did. I quit, and I thought, what's the point of all this? It's almost like it's worse before I was saved. And so, you know, unfortunately, that's what happens when we mix law and grace in our teaching. And I'm not saying I despise, you know, my background or anything. I'm grateful for all of that. In actual fact, it's helped me appreciate and understand the grace of God more so. But at the end of the day, there's no way anyone can survive under legalistic teaching. And you know, that's the heart of God. And that's why I believe He's been so passionate, compassionate, so patient with humanity, is because He wants the truth to come out. And if you want to know how much evil and flesh, humanity, fallen humanity, hates gospel truth, All you have to see is how churches and ministry like ours get attacked. He tries to just squash them down, shut them up, because he doesn't want truth taught. It's better for him to have some form of legalism than to have gospel truth out there. And so, anyway, and so that's the reason, one of the reasons why I want to share this with you today. Why the resurrection is our victory over sin and spiritual death. So let's begin by reading 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 to 57. 
from the King James. And you know why I read from the King James? Not because I'm part of a cult or anything. Did you know that there's actually a cult? They don't call themselves a cult, but they have every trait of a cult who only read the King James. The King James diehard. Seriously, I'm, I'm trying to think of the name. Uh, they are really weird. I watched some of their videos and I thought, man, you worship the King James more than you worship God. But it doesn't take away the fact that the King James is probably the most accurate word-by-word -word translation in English that we have. The Young's literal is prime because that translates the tenses too. But it's harder to understand. As you know, how many of you have tried doing Bible study or reading the Young's literal? It's like going to a Greek or Hebrew lesson. It sounds like Yoda, you know, go to church, I will. And it's, it, it's just, it's hard to understand. But the King James does a good job. I wish, and you know, the New King James, many people use the New King James. But one of the issues that I have with the New King James is, is that the New King James does what most modern translations do. Change little words. But when you change a little word, you change the whole meaning of doctrine. Like, for example, we live by the faith of Jesus. That's what King James says, and that's the way it is in the original. What does it mean to live by the faith of someone? In other words, someone else, it took someone else to use their faith, what they believed, to achieve something. And we live by that person's faith, right? And then the New King James says, we live by faith in. So they change the word of to in. And what does it mean to live by faith in someone? Now you have to come up with a faith. So now it's your faith in what they've done. And so you've got to learn to work your faith, build your faith, and then we have shipwreck faith and mountain-moving faith and all kinds of doctrines because one word was changed. And so that's the reason why we read from the King James. But anyway, so let's read this here. 1 Corinthians 15, 50, and it doesn't get it 100% right, but it's pretty accurate. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54 to 57. It's on the screen there. So now this is Paul the Apostle, obviously writing inspired by the Holy Spirit. And what he is doing here is, as you will see, he's literally moved forward into eternity, and he's looking back from eternity to this life, and he makes statements about this life from the perspective of eternity, but yet he mentions truths that are applicable to us who are here. Does that make sense? So he says, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption. So what is he talking about? He's talking about when this fallen body, we shed this fallen body and we take on our glorified eternal body. That's what he's talking about, right? This body is corruptible. The one we are going to be in is going to be incorruptible, right? So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Praise God. And then he says, I mean, that could have been enough, but then watch what he says next. O oh, death, so now he's talking to death. O oh, death, where is thy sting? Where is your sting? O oh, grave, now he's talking to the grave. Where is thy victory? And then watch what he says, and here's the key. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. He's not talking about what police officers enforce. He's talking about the law of God, the old covenant law, what Jews know as Moses' law, what we know as the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the basis of the law. There's another 603 on top of that. You see, you read about that in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, the Torah. And so you add them up, you've got 613 laws. That's what he's talking about. And he says, the strength of sin is the law of God. Or you could say it this way. The strength of sin is God's perfect standard, because that's what his law is. It's his perfect standard, right? Now that sounds a little heavy duty. I mean, most people probably here would stand up and scream at Paul and say, that is heresy. 
for you to say that God's perfect law is the strength of sin. That sounds like God is in cahoots with sin, with evil. Wouldn't you agree? If my perfect standard causes you to do wrong, then who's in the wrong? It sounds like that, doesn't it? And yet that's what he's saying. But then he says, watch this in verse 57. But thanks be to God, which gives us, or who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So your victory as a believer over sin is, comes from where? From you not sinning? From you doing your best to be good? From you confessing all your sins every day? From you trying to live the good life as best as you can? Is that where it comes from? Where does it come from? Jesus. In other words, what he did on the cross. So Jesus in the finished work of the cross. So our victory comes from what he's done, not from what we do or what we don't do. Now, does that mean that it's okay for us not to bother with good behavior, good conduct? Of course not. But you should never rely on that to give you the victory. So when you pray, do you pray for victory? Or do you pray from victory? You see, that's the difference here. Because the victory is in Jesus. So we already stand. When we receive salvation in Jesus, we stand on the victory that Jesus got for us. We don't have to get the victory. But mix law and grace, and what does it tell you? Yes, you begin with a victory in Jesus, but now you have to fight hard to keep that victory and get more victory. Isn't that so? And is that what it says here? No. We have victory over sin and over the grave in Jesus. Right? So you can see here that Paul is asking two different entities because he addresses them, and he asks them each a question. Firstly, he says, death, where is your sting? He's looking from the perspective of eternity. So when you and I leave this earthly body and we end up in heaven, we can look back and say, death, you can't sting me anymore. Right? And that's what we're going to say. We're going to say, death, you can't. Not you can't. Death, you can't sting me anymore. Right? Because it's not going to be able to. And also, we're going to be able to say to the grave, grave, where is your victory? You buried me once, but you can't do it again. Right? And all that we have because of what Jesus has done. So he's looking from beyond death, and basically, he is stating two facts about those who are in heaven. Are you with me? Fact number one is, is that death no longer will have an effect on them, no longer has an effect on them. They cannot die again. Secondly, the grave has no victory over them. They cannot be buried again. Right? I mean, those are awesome realities to look forward to. Wouldn't you agree? So you cannot die again, and sin cannot kill you again. Now, you know, one of the best ways that I can illustrate what he's talking about, we're going somewhere with all this, okay? And so he has this bee. Imagine my hand is the bee, and this finger has the, the uh, stinger. He says, death, where is thy sting? So he calls the bee death. He calls the sting sin. And then he calls, once the, the, the bee stings you, he calls the poison, or the strength of the poison, he calls God's law. So the damage that it does to you is because of God's perfect standard. But he is encouraging the believer here. And the reason for that is because of the fall, the fall of humanity that is, everyone is bound to experience two types of death. Firstly, physical death. Secondly, spiritual death. That's what sin has done to us. When Adam and Eve sinned, sin entered creation, and now sin causes death. That's what its thing is. It causes death, and it can kill you physically, and it does eventually kill us physically, but it can also kill us spiritually. Right? Genesis 2 verse 17. Okay, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this is God speaking to Adam, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Did that happen when Adam and Eve sinned? Not physically, but they died spiritually, right? So what caused spiritual death? 
sin. And apparently, sin draws its strength from God's law. What is spiritual death, by the way? Spiritual death is exactly that, separation from God. It's alienation from God. It's being separated from God, from His presence. That's spiritual death, right? And no one in the right mind would want to be separated from God for eternity. Wouldn't you agree with me? Some people say they are, but I believe that they're not in their right mind. All right, so now let's look at this one. Genesis 3.19, talking about physical death, all in the same account. Then God says to him, by the sweat of your face you will eat bread, watch this, until you return to the ground. For from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So what is he talking about there? He's talking about physical death. So you can see from that that God basically revealed to mankind, to humanity, that sin can not only cause physical death, but it can also cause spiritual death, right? And what is physical death? Physical death is separation from this world and everything we hold dear in this world, right? And it's a sad reality that we all have to face because of the fall. But in truth, I'm glad that we're going to face that. Because if we had to live forever this way, who wants to sign up? I mean, we love our people. We love everything we get to enjoy in this life. But do we love the pain, the sickness, the tragedy, the hurt, all these, the hardship, the horrible things that come with this fallen world? Who wants to live forever that way. That's why God kicked them out of the garden. He says, because if they keep eating from the tree of life, they're going to live that way forever, and he didn't want that for us. I don't want to live that way forever. Can you imagine being like those of old, living a hundred? How much was it? Like 900, a thousand years? So in a way, physical death is a blessing to us, because it frees us from this. But it doesn't mean we should look for it. It doesn't mean we should rush to get there. But nonetheless, that's what sin does and has, continues to do to humanity. And remember, Paul said, it is, sin draws its strength from God's law. So how does God's law infuse that? How does God's law aid that and help someone die physically, help someone die spiritually? How does God's law do that? Well, First of all, we know that neither spiritual nor physical death were God's original plan and purpose for humanity, right? You believe that? I mean, they both came as a result of the fall. Romans 5 verse 12 from the Passion Translation. Remember I said we're going somewhere here, okay? Watch what it says there from the Passion. When Adam sinned, watch this, the entire world was affected. Is that true? Sure it is. Sin entered human experience. Now remember, sin draws its power, its strength, from God's law. Are you with me? So let me ask you this question while we're reading that. If you were as evil as anything, if you were the master of evil, not that I'm wishing that on you, okay? But if you were the master of evil, and you knew this truth, that God's law, God's perfect standard, actually strengthens sin and allows sin to be more potent and gives it its potency. If you were the master of evil, what would you do? Wouldn't you find a way to make sure that God's law is always at its maximum in the picture so that sin can have its maximum effect? Now, I know some people may listen to this in the future and think, wow, that sounds like heresy. Are you speaking against God's law? Some people have accused me of being an antinomian, and it's not someone who hates ants. An antinomian. <laughs> An antinomian is someone who supposedly hates God's law. I don't hate God's law. I love God's law. I'm for God's law for the reasons God gave the law. But the point is that we, we're getting to a deeper truth here. But wouldn't you agree with me? If you were the master of evil, that's what you would do. If the law gives sin strength, then you would make sure that the law is always in the picture, right? Okay, I have two mm -hmm's there, so I'll just carry on. All right. So sin entered human experience, and death was the result. And so death followed the sin, watch this, casting its shadow over all humanity because all have sinned. So, question. 
Do you become a sinner when you commit your first known sin at the age of understanding? Or were you born a sinner? The sad truth is, as good as some of us think we are, as some of us think we are like Mother Teresa, some of us think we're like the greatest pope out there, but the fact of the matter is, this is that we're all descendants of Adam, natural descendants of Adam. Yes? I have one yes, thank you. All right, so was Adam fallen when he had the rest of his offspring? Yes, he was. Oh, my goodness. What are we doing here today? Okay. So he had, he, he could not possibly reproduce unfallen descendants. All he could reproduce was after himself because God said the seed will produce after itself. All he could produce was fallen beings. So we don't become a sinner when we commit our first known sin at the age of understanding. We are born sinners. We are born into sin. And this is why we have a propensity to sin. Now, God doesn't hold children accountable until the age of understanding because the Bible actually says where there's no law, there's no transgression. So that's true, right? But once we reach that age of understanding, we're fully accountable and we know and we realize, right? But we sin because that's our nature. That's our propensity. That's why we are drawn to that. doesn't mean we should give in to it, but that's why we do it, right? And so that's what this is saying. It's saying because that's why all humanity sinned, it says at the end. That's why, because we're all descendants of a fallen being. So we live in this fallen body, right? So because of sin, as Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 15, He mentions two things. He says, humanity was stung with death, right? And God's law is sin's strength. Remember that? Let's read that same portion, that same verse from the Passion Translation. Watch how it puts it. It actually makes it easier to understand. It says, it is sin that gives death its sting. So death can't sting you without sin. So we wouldn't die if sin wasn't in the picture, right? And watch this again. And the law that gives sin its power. So where does sin get its power to sting from? The law. So you have to ask yourself, when death comes along on the planet, the law has, something to, has everything to do with it. Are you with me? Am I right in saying that? So sin gives death the ability to sting and kill us physically and spiritually, right? And sin is able to do that from the strength it gets from God's perfect standard. Doesn't that sound weird? I know some of you are getting irritated and saying, okay, can you tell us really where you're going with this and what you're saying? I will in a moment. So because sin knows that an imperfect people, or let me put it this way at least, yeah. Because sin knows that an imperfect people can never live up to and satisfy a perfect standard. That's why sin uses God's law and draws its strength from. Let me give you an example to illustrate that. Let's say we drive down the road. and Now you can see outside here, there's still some development going on. So they may not have all the speed sign limits out there. Okay? And so if you don't see a speed sign limit for a long stretch on the road, what are you going to do? We're going to ride as we feel comfortable, right? Someone said, slow down. You just lied. (laughs) But I mean, you're going to ride how you feel comfortable. So if you're feeling like, you know, you're in the F1 race, you're going to drive crazy. Or if you're like me, you're going, I've been accused of driving like Miss Daisy or something, because that's just the way I like driving. I'm not in a rush to go anywhere. And so, um, whatever. So there's no speed sign limit. So whatever speed you ride, when you get to, your, to the end, are you going to feel guilty about how you drove? No, because there was nothing to tell you. But what if there was a speed limit and it said 40 miles per hour and you rode at 70 miles per hour? Would you feel guilty? Of course you will, right? And if you drove at 10 miles an hour, you'd feel guilty too. So what has happened? What has infused that guilt that shame, that condemnation. A law that was placed to tell you where you're going wrong. That's why, see, there's nothing wrong with God's law. 
God's law is perfect. It's a perfect standard. But we as imperfect people can never live up to it because we're not perfect. And so if all you get taught and shown is God's law, God's law, where you should measure up, where you don't measure up, where you've failed, where you haven't done this, where you've done this but not good enough, the law is perfect. Can an imperfect person satisfy a perfect standard? We can get to 99.9, but we're never going to be able to satisfy it 100% because we're imperfect, right? And that's why sin draws its power from it. Because sin, so it, in sin's interest, in death's interest, it's in its best interest to get you fully acquainted with God's law. Because the more acquainted you are with the law of God, the more strength it's, it can exert, it can exercise over you. So the more you will live with guilt, shame, and condemnation. And I'm telling you, you're describing my life in my BG days, before grace days. Because that's all I was ever taught. That's the environment that I was in, and I'm not blaming anyone. I was there. But here's the point. I would wake up in the morning. You know, my whole day was spent in guilt, shame, and condemnation. Because I would wake up in the morning and I'd feel guilty for not waking up earlier. Then I would go and have my quiet time. And I would feel guilty because I didn't pray in tongues long enough. And I had to go. Then I would feel bad because I didn't read all the chapters in my, uh, what do you call those things? Huh? My reading plan, yeah. And then I would feel guilty because I didn't confess enough scriptures over my health and my prosperity and my well-being. Then I would go and spend the day, you know, with people and work with them. And I would feel bad because I wasn't sweet and friendly to the one and I was to the other. I would feel guilty because I didn't phone my wife. I didn't say hi to my child. And the whole circle would just go on and on and on. And then I would start feeling pain. And I would think, you know, this is happening because I wasn't good the last month. And then I would get some diagnosis and I would think, it's something that I've done. It's something that I haven't done. And then I would take the guilt of that. And so I would get the scriptures. I would begin to trust God and confess and declare. But subconsciously, sin would tell me, using the law, you really deserve this, you know. Because people who see you don't know what you've been up to. So really, you deserve this. So my faith can't even function fully because in the back of my mind, my conscience is telling me something else by the law. And so sin is stinging me with death. It's trying to take me out and destroy me using God's law against me. That's what God's law looks like in everyday living. And that's why it says that sin draw, draws its strength from God's perfect standard. There's nothing wrong with God's perfect standard. But because we live in this fallen body and sin is there, that's how it tries to destroy us and bring us down. Does that make sense? And this is the point that Paul is addressing. And he's saying, when you're in heaven, you're going to look back and say, death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? He says that. But then he says, you need to live in that victory now. Because he says, you have that victory now in Jesus. In other words, when you get revelation that sin uses God's law, God's perfect standard, to bring death and continue stinging you, you need to realize you have victory over that in Jesus. Isn't that the reason why Paul said that? All that? It doesn't mean that we should become desensitized to God's standard, but we cannot let that determine our well-being. Right? So when you mess up, what do you do? Do you let sin pound you with guilt, shame, and condemnation and use the law of God against you and sting you with death some more? So you're going to think, well, I deserve that because I did mess up. I should get sick. I should get that sickness. That, yeah, I understand that. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to confess everything else to everyone else, but subconsciously, I know that I provoked this. I'm probably just speaking to myself here, and that's fine. I'll just keep doing that. But am I going to do that? Or am I going to say, you know, it is all true, but at the end of the day, I stand in the victory that I have in Jesus. That's where my victory is at. It's not based on my merit, 
my performance of living up to God's law because I can never do that. That's why God did away with that way of relating to him through the cross and he introduced a new way of relating to him, which is called grace. What does grace say? You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. But it's yours anyway because God loves you. Right? You see, people think you're crazy when you live that way. But that's living by the gospel truth. Let's have a look at that same portion from two other translations. First of all, from The Voice. Watch this. It says, Sin came into this world, and death sting followed. Then sin took aim. Watch this. I love the way this voice puts it. Then sin took aim at the law. Watch this. And gained power over those who follow the law. So who does sin have the most success with in stinging them with death? Those who decide to live by a standard of sorts. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have one, because we all should have one, right? But when you live, first and foremost, by a moral standard, when you live by a standard of conduct and behavior, more than you live by the grace of God and the finished work of the cross and the victory you have in Jesus, what are you doing? You are allowing sin to use the law against you and continue stinging you with death. Right? Okay, I'll just keep speaking to myself here. So anyway, <clears throat> let's, re let's read the same portion from the New Life Version. Watch this. The pain in death is sin. Now watch this. Sin has power over those under the law. How often do you hear scandals in the most legalistic of churches where they pound you with standards, with codes, with living up to this and living up to that and the consequence of this if you don't do this and if you do that. And every service involves a repentance altar call where you all come to the front and you bow down to Jesus and you get cleansed until the next week. And then we repeat that all over again. That's law. So the whole week they go there living and think, but guess what is happening? Have you noticed that that's what happens generally in the legalistic in portion of Christendom? People suffer, they experience this, they experience that. There's always something going on because sin is stinging them with death because they yield themselves to the law of God. And didn't God say in Hebrews that he did away with that way of relating to him? And he only did it for a certain time because the people wanted that. But he also did it to show us how we are incapable of living up to that law. And that's why we need grace. Isn't that so? But I have seen, and I'm throwing myself in that pot, I have seen some good, grace-believing Christians still try and live by some code. And therefore, they still experience death stinging them. Amen? So sin releases its ability to kill over those who choose to relate to God by law, first and foremost. Amen? Hello, someone? What does it look like to relate to God by law? You try and live by your merit and your performance. God, I'm doing this, so you should bless me. I'm not doing that, so you, you should notice that and realize how good I'm being because I'm avoiding those things. That's living by law. Now, am I saying that we should have no moral compass at all? Of course not. But you, that shouldn't be the basis of your faith, of your confidence and trust in God. And that's what Paul was saying. He's saying, if you, don't want the sting of if you don't want to experience the sting of death like you're going to in eternity, if you don't want the grave to draw you to it sooner than, you, than it should, then live by the victory you have in Jesus. And by the way, relate to God by grace, not by law. Isn't that what he, in essence what he's saying? You see, God's law was never designed for an imperfect people. God's perfect law was designed for a perfect people. Never for an imperfect people. That's why we can never, never live up to it. Amen. Look at Romans 3.19 from the Passion again. It says, Now we realize that everything the law says is addressed to those who are under its authority. This is for two reasons. So that every excuse will be silenced. In other words, no one will be able to say, 
I can explain why I couldn't live up to that. No one. With no boasting of innocence, and so that the entire world will be held accountable to God's standards. In other words, imperfect people cannot live up to a perfect standard. And so if you try, you're going to enjoy death giving you a sting repeatedly over and over and over. Amen? You see, it's impossible for, human, for humanity to live up to a perfect standard because we just cannot. We've fallen. Amen? And that's what Paul is saying and he's bringing up the resurrection of Jesus here. Look at Romans 6 verse 23. Watch this. For sin's mega wage is death. So you want to work for sin, guess what it's going to pay you? Its minimum wage is death. Who wants more? Now you know why. Watch this. But God's lavish gift is life eternal. Why try and earn and deserve something that God God gives to you as a gift? It says found in your union with the Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. That's where it's found. Not in your marriage, your performance. And then look at how the New Living puts verse 57 of 1 Corinthians 15. It says, but thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus. But what is the key that he brought into that? Don't relate to God by law. Right? I mean, here he's speaking the language of grace. He's talking about God's lavish gift. And he says, you know, the, the victory is through our Lord Jesus. That's a gift. That's all grace talk. Amen. Praise God. Praise God for his wonderful goodness. Amen. And praise God that the resurrection of Jesus made that all possible. I, I might not have used the word uh, resurrection. I may not have given you a reference that said the resurrection. But this is all on the basis of the resurrection. This is why he is the guarantee of our victory of his sin and spiritual death. Amen. Let's end off with this one. 2 Corinthians 2.14, the Passion. God always makes His grace visible in Christ. Praise God for that. Who includes us as partners, watch this, of His endless triumph. Through our yielded lives, He spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere we go. So at the end of the day, once more the encouragement is relate to God by grace Live by the finished work of the cross, by the victory you have in Jesus, and stop letting death continue to sting you and the grave draw you to itself, all because you choose to relate to God by law.